This is the basics of environmental monitoring, and I'm going to be going from collection through to identification of microorganisms in controlled environments. Uh, what I'd like to do to start is go through the agenda of what we'll be talking about today. First of all, I'm going to describe and demonstrate a laser particle counter. The particular particle counter that I'm going to be using collects data on particles, total number of particles for non-viable contaminants. This particular uh, laser particle counter is made by uh, Biotest Diagnostics. Second thing we're going to be doing is demonstrating the use of a centrifugal air sampler. This is also made by Biotest Diagnostics, and this will actually collect uh, for incubation the viable contaminants that are contained within our air uh, in controlled environments. Third, I'm going to be describing and demonstrating contact strips that are uh, media, special media uh, filled strips that are used for collecting uh, viable contaminants from surfaces and from people. Uh, personnel are required to be uh, monitored in controlled environments and uh, we will be uh, looking at that as well. And lastly, I'm going to be describing and demonstrating an automated slide stainer, which is made by uh, EMD, and it's the Midas 3 uh, slide stainer. This uh, has the capability of uh, using several different staining techniques. Today, we're going to be using gram staining uh, to identify the viable contaminants from one of our contact strips. Okay, let's look again at the instruments and the media that we're going to be using. The Biotest APC Plus is a non-viable particle counter. Uh, this collects samples from the air. It will collect uh, up to one cubic foot of air, and it also monitors uh, or collects particles in four different sizes, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 1, and 5 micron size particles. The Biotest RCS uh, Plus is our centrifugal air sampler, which will sample a thousand liters of air uh, in 20 minutes for the particular instrument that I have. Uh, the high-speed RCS Pluses that Biotest Diagnostics uh, makes today can sample a thousand liters of air, which is, by the way, uh, the required amount of uh, air that the FDA requires you to sample. Uh, but that will do it in 10 minutes on the high-speed sampler. The Midas 3 automated slide stainer uh, has the capability of doing multiple different types of uh, staining uh, techniques, and it is programmable to whatever the user uh, would uh, desire for their particular staining techniques, and we'll be talking about that in just a little while. The uh, centrifugal air sampler uses a strip uh, that is made from triptic soy auger, which is a very good growth medium for uh, collecting the uh, contaminants from the air uh, and actually uh, putting them into the incubator in a uh, uh, suitable container. And the triptic soy contact strips are very similar. It's the same uh, type of uh, uh, media that can be used for sampling flat surfaces. Uh, some rounded surfaces, and also personnel, uh, particularly their fingertips, uh, when it's important to have uh, sterile technique tested. All right, let's first look at the Biotest APC Plus laser particle counter. I have one here, and it actually has um, the uh, carrying case, a padded carrying case, that uh, is easily uh, uh, opened and can, contains all the uh, accessories that are necessary to go with this particular instrument, including the software that is used uh, to download the data onto uh, a PC. We have the instrument itself with an LED screen and uh, easy touch buttons. On the side of the instrument, we have an RS-232 cable, which comes provided from the manufacturer. In the case, we have an isokinetic probe, which actually helps funnel the correct volume of air into the laser particle counter. We have a filter, which simulates and helps to clear the uh, chamber where the air is drawn into uh, as it is sampled into the laser particle counter. And there are three different 
uh, adapters for use in uh, countries where uh, the, the voltage might be slightly different. This is our uh, APC Plus particle counter. Uh, it's really good because the simultaneous counting of particles occurs at all four of those different sizes uh, at the, uh, just at the press of a button. Uh, and those sizes are typically the sizes that are monitored, uh, whether you're uh, monitoring in the United States, European countries, in Japan, wherever in the world you happen to be. It also monitors the temperature and the relative humidity in the atmosphere and the environment in which it's running. And it will sample up to 200 locations. Uh, there are three sampling modes. You can sample one single mode if that's all you need. You can sample sequential modes where it will uh, sample one right after the other and at each uh, interval we'll uh, uh, record the data that it has gotten, uh, that it has collected. And then it has a continuous mode that you can set automatically that will continuously run over and over and over. And you can even program a pause in between each of the counts if you uh, like. The display uh, monitors particles in three different modes. The total number of particles, the particles per cubic foot, or the particles per liter, whatever your desire is. The flow rate of this particular instrument is 0.1 cubic feet per minute, uh, and it will extrapolate the data to one cubic foot uh, in one minute for those uh, who are required to monitor one cubic foot of air uh, for their data. It is Windows compatible with the software that it has, and you can purchase for a few hundred dollars an optional thermal printer uh, and paper. Again, these are the parts for the instrument uh, in the picture, and I'd like to demonstrate it for just a, a minute for you. All right, this is our particle counter, and I'm going to screw the filter onto the particle counter first. Remove the cap. I'm going to turn the power on. I'm going to set it at whatever particle size I'm interested in, and it's simply a matter of pressing the start button. And I can let it run for one minute, and it will collect a tenth of a cubic foot of air through this filter and then extrapolate that since I have it set to cubic feet per minute to whatever the count is through that filter. And it should be fairly low. Now I'm going to stop it. I can unscrew to get the actual count of the particles in the air. I will unscrew the filter. Screw on the isokinetic probe so that it will pull through the one tenth of a cubic foot of air. Make sure it's set at 0.5, and I can then start that, and it will collect, very simply, one-tenth of a cubic foot of air and extrapolate that to what the count would be in one cubic foot of air, since that's what my settings are. It will also tell me the relative humidity and the temperature of the room where I'm at. That is our particle count. Now, what I'd like to do is show you, I have a, a smoke generator and a class 100 hood that I would like to uh, demonstrate how efficient some of the filters are by creating the smoke. Now, once in the hood, if this was a controlled environment, I could place my particle counter in the hood, and for uh, FDA regulated environments, it's important that I monitor at least 0.5 because that's the, the particle size that classifications of clean rooms are, uh, are done at, at 0.5 micrometers, and I can place the hood or the particle counter in the hood, 
and actually monitor the air quality within the hood uh, through the uh, total number of, or for the total number of particles through the laser particle counter. And if you can see, it's counting the number of particles and it is actually drawing into the uh, isokinetic probe the correct volume of air to equal 0.1 uh, uh, cubic feet per minute. And with that, it will then extrapolate to whatever it would uh, be for one cubic foot per minute. And I'll let that run for the entire 60 seconds so you can see what the actual particle count is. Right now it's sitting at 11, 10. Okay, that's 10. 0.5 micrometer particles per cubic foot that was collected in one minute's time within this class 100 environment. That's rather good. That's actually uh, suitable for manufacturing, if this was a clean room environment, for manufacturing uh, injectable drugs. Remember that the classification under Federal Standard 209E or ISO 14644 uh, also requires to have less than 100 particles per cubic foot to be able to manufacture injectable drugs. So that is how a laser particle counter works for total particle counts in controlled environments. Now let's look at, if we will, uh, if we can, a centrifugal air sampler. Centrifugal air samplers are used for sampling viable contaminants within the air, those that are living. This particular RCS plus centrifugal air sampler uh, has many applications. First of all, we can use it to investigate the microbial quality of the air in the environment in which we're doing our work. We can actually use it to investigate uh, how effective our air treatment equipment is, how uh, our HVAC system and our filtration equipment, uh, how effective they are. We can also use a centrifugal air sampler to uh, determine how effective our decontamination procedures and uh, steps are within controlled environments. And it's also valuable uh, when we're working in laminar flow hoods, rooms, or any type of a sterile area to evaluate the air quality of that particular room. Now, the uh, centrifugal air sampler that I have is the RCS Plus. It samples 50 liters uh, per minute, um, and uh, it takes 20 minutes for the one that I have. The high-speed ones are half that time, 10 minutes. Uh, 100 liters per minute on the high-speed. Uh, each centrifugal air sampler that you uh, get from Biotest Diagnostics is provided with a 7.2 volt rechargeable battery and charger. Uh, and it will sample anything from 10 to 20, 50, 100, 200, 500, up to 1,000 liters. Okay, that's a misprint. That should say 1,000 liters. Uh, and we can program it to have three additional volumes up to 2,000 liters, right at 2,000 liters, 1999. Here's a drawing that has the parts label for a centrifugal air sampler. And each part uh, is set uh, aside by a number, and the diagram has the corresponding number, so you can un understand what those parts are. And I'm going to actually show you what that is in just a minute. Now, how does this work? Well, a centrifugal air sampler uses impaction. It actually draws air into the top rotor of the uh, sampler itself and throws or impacts particles onto the triptic soy auger uh, where it is uh, then capable of sticking and then growing if it is a viable organism. Again, two different speeds depending on whether you have the high speed or not. This particular chart shows you how efficient and how effective a centrifugal air sampler is compared to a sieve sampler, which is commonly used in the, the pharmaceutical industry as well. Uh, an RCS high flow sampler in particular will uh, provide you with a, a better 
uh, means of collecting viable contaminants from uh, the uh, air in the environment, the controlled environment where you're working. The strips that go into the sampler uh, are varied and they're provided um, by um, biotest diagnostics in several different types. There are uh, sterile strips, there are strips with uh, media in it to uh, help promote the growth of particular types of organisms that you're looking for. Uh, we have um, uh, rose bengal auger strips that are used for yeasts and molds that are found primarily in environments where filtration is uh, uh, not uh, so readily available. Uh, we have uh, several other types of uh, strips that are used for various types of bacteria that, that may be resident in a particular environment where you happen to be working. And one of the benefits with biotest diagnostics is that you can buy blank sterile strips uh, and prepare any custom preparations of media that you wish to use for that particular uh, for a, a particular application. There are several advantages to these strips. Each strip is individually uh, sealed, uh, which helps protect them from drying out, from desiccation. Uh, it also protects the strips from uh, contamination, uh, secondary uh, contamination from the air, such as uh, uh, settling of contaminant, uh, contaminants uh, onto that strip. It also helps minimize the amount of waste that we have because we can actually store these strips for a longer period of time. They're very easy to store. They're very easy to transport. Uh, typically, we can store these strips from 2 degrees Celsius, uh, a nice, cool, refrigerated temperature, up to room temperature or around 25 degrees Celsius, except for some of the specialty uh, auger strips that they um, manufacture. This reduces condensation uh, based on whatever temperature you're going to be storing it at. Uh, you can store them at room temperature if you'd like. Uh, you do not have to pre-warm the media prior uh, to using if it is at room temperature. Uh, this also reduces the need for refrigerated space. Uh, and it also uh, helps uh, to know that you can actually store these in various locations uh, so you can reduce the amount of transportation uh, issues that you might have. And they typically have an extended shelf life, whereas if you were making your own media, you might have an internal policy of uh, storing the strips for maybe uh, 24, 48 hours, or, or the media for 24, 48 hours. Typically, these have a two to three month shelf life, so that helps uh, in uh, purchasing decisions as well. The material uh, that is used for the packaging is clear, uh, transparent, so that you can see through it and count the colony forming units that have grown onto the, the media, uh, which is really nice because then you don't have the associated odors that come with some of the, the organisms that are growing. Uh, you can open it. It's very easy to open these strips from the packaging without uh, touching them and contaminating uh, the, the auger itself. And they're free of uh, halogens, which is good for uh, uh, waste management. Waste management, uh, and they're validated. There's, they, there's just really no disadvantages to having the, the auger strips, and they're validated according to ISO standards. All right, I'd like to demonstrate very briefly what one of these looks like. This is. And it also comes in a case. This is your centrifugal air sampler. Again, this is not the high-speed sampler. Part of the sampler comes off, and this is the cover, and it has little uh, notches on the side here where you can easily uh, fit the notches and then screw it so that it's tight and in place and ready to use. This is the rotor that actually spins within uh, the sampler itself. And this is the 7.2 volt battery that comes with it. On the back of the sampler is a door that can be opened. The battery slides right in. It can only fit in one way, in one direction. Slide it in, lock it into place 
ready to go. This is one of the triptych soy auger strips that I have. And again, as I mentioned, it's very easy to open. It's transparent, very easy to see. And it just peels back. We can grab it by the end, hold it on the sides, load it into the rotor with the flat side facing the internal uh, axis of the rotor. And it slides all the way down and circles around until you can get it right in place. The entire internal surface of the rotor is now uh, surrounded by the triptych soy auger. It's magnetic, so it fits onto the spindle and we'll easily turn. We can put our cover back on, lock it into place. We're going to turn our power on and it's set for a thousand liters to sample. And it's actually drawing air into the top of the sampler, expelling the air out at the bottom, but before it comes out at the bottom, it's spinning that air at such a high velocity that it's throwing or impacting any particulate that is collected onto the surface of the auger strip so that if any of that, uh, those particles are viable or living contaminants, they will grow on that auger strip. has another benefit in that it's remote controlled. So you can actually place this inside of a hood or inside of a controlled environment, let it sit for a few minutes, let the, the air settle a little bit, and then you can turn it on or off by remote control. That way the person doesn't actually affect the environment in which it's sitting. And I'm going to stop it a little early. I'm going to remove the rotor, grab the strip by the tab, pull it out. I'm going to hold it from the sides so as not to contaminate it. And I'm going to place it back into the container that it came from, slide it in, and when I slide it in, it'll only fit in in one, one direction, and then I have a little cover slip that I can place on it. And then I can label on the outside with a, a marker the location that that came from, and then I can set it aside and have it available for incubation. Now the FDA requires that we incubate our environmental monitoring samples that are viable contaminants for 72 hours at 22 and a half degrees Celsius, plus or minus two and a half degrees, or uh, when we're finished at 32 and a half degrees Celsius, plus or minus two and a half degrees. Uh, and that is for an additional 72 hours. Now you can collect two samples, one at 22 and a half, one at 32 and a half, and incubate them, or collect one sample, store it for 72 hours, take that same sample, and store it for an additional 72 hours. Obviously, you're spending twice as much with two strips if you collect two different samples, and it takes twice as long to collect those, uh, but you have uh, uh, a much shorter duration for incubation, which would only be three days. Okay, let's move on and look at our triptych soy auger contact strips. Now these are very similar to the auger air strips that you uh, just looked at, and these particular strips also come in a variety of uh, different styles with uh, various microorganisms uh, targeted for uh, use. And what we are going to be looking at today is just a, a sterile triptych soy auger strip. Now, before we actually look at that strip and see how that works, let's look at uh, a little bit about this particular strip. Very similar to the auger strips, these contact slides, though, are for surface sampling. Uh, each slide is uh, individually wrapped, meets uh, the standard contact area of 25 square centimeters that the USP and the uh, EP guidelines recommend uh, that we have, or require that we have, and that's 25 square centimeters of contact space. 
The individual packaging allows you to use only what you need. Uh, and they're uh, sealed so that you don't have that kind of uh, potential for contamination from the uh, external environment. They can be stored just like the auger air strips between 2 and 25 degrees Celsius, except for your specialty strips. Again, because they're individually wrapped, we have uh, very little potential for contamination. The cost is much less than what it would cost to uh, manufacture your own RODAC uh, plates used for sample, uh, sampling surfaces. Uh, it eliminates waste of the media because you're really uh, just putting this into a biohazard and you have a much smaller strip than what you would have with a RODAC plate. Uh, they're securely sealed, sealed after their uh, use, so you don't have a potential of dropping a plate and losing a lid or cross-contaminating lids and potentially ruining your sample. Uh, they have an integrated hole in the package that makes it ideal for hanging in uh, an isolator environment if, it's, if suspending of the strip is required. Uh, they're resistant to various gas decontamination cycles that are uh, typically used inside of isolators. They're flexible that, so that you can use them for curved surfaces. Now, they're not great for 90-degree uh, angle surfaces, but uh, inside of a vessel, they're very pliable, and you can uh, run these along the, the inside of a, um, a rounded surface inside of a vessel. Uh, you can use it as a settling plate if you'd like to, simply by turning it over with the auger side facing up and use that as a settle plate. Uh, makes it real good, since they're already gamma radiated and sterile, for transferring into clean rooms. All you have to do is decontaminate the outside of the package, and they can, uh, can be shipped to you double wrapped uh, before uh, transfer into a clean room as well. Uh, avail available in different formulations, and the storage, as I said, uh, is uh, room temperature up to uh, 25 degrees Celsius. All right, let's take a look at one of these strips. This is a triptych soy auger sterile strip. Opens just like a strip does with the air. We pull it out. We're careful not to touch the flat surface of the strip. That is our auger surface. And it's simply, if our surface area, we make sure that we have entire coverage just by patting it down just a little bit. We have our 25 square centimeter surface. We place it back into the container. Flat end up. We'll close it. We'll slide our cover strip back onto it. And then we have it available for incubation, just like we did with our air strip. Okay? Now, what we're looking at now is a strip of auger that we're going to, uh, that we use for a surface. We're actually going to be fixing some microorganisms to a slide so that we can prepare it for incubation. When fixing the organism to a slide, we have a procedure that we use, and I'll be going through this procedure with you. All right, first I'd like to open this particular contact slide that I have and that I have already incubated. And if I can get it so that there's not much glare, there's quite a bit of growth on this surface, contact surface slide that we have. I can pull this out, and we'll have the flat side up so that we'll have it available for use. I'm going to turn on my burner. One of the things I want to do is make sure that my inoculating loop is clean and sterile, so I'm going to sterilize it using flame. And I'm going to set it down for just a minute. I have 
have some sterile water and a needle. And I'm going to draw up some of that sterile water into this needle so I can use it to emulsify some of the bacteria that I have on the slide. I'll do two slides here so that we can show when we do our gram staining how we can do multiple slides at one time. I'm looking for very clean slides to put these on. Yeah, there's some good clean slides for us right here. And what I'm going to do is place one drop of water onto each slide. I'm going to take my sterile loop, let it cool for just one minute. All right, I'm going to actually sample and emulsify by mixing. into the water. I'm going to re-sterilize and kill that particular colony of bacteria and I'm going to find a different colony that I want to sample. I'll let that cool. Alright, then I'm going to take a different colony and I'm going to mix or emulsify that particular organism into the second drop of water on the second slide. Again, I want a flame to clean my inoculating loop. I'm going to put my contact slide back into the container in case I need to use it again. Now what I'd like to do is show you how to heat fix a slide, an organism to the slide, by running it gently through the heat. Now one of the things I don't want to do is cook this to the point where it starts to sizzle. I'd like to just gently evaporate the water while still killing the living organism that I have emulsified in the drop of water. And that's the first one. And that has dried. And the second one I can heat fix. And that has also dried. That is essentially how we heat fix an organism from our uh, viable media source and we prepare it for uh, gram stain. Now, let me talk about the Midas 3 automated slide stainer. This is a picture of the uh, Midas 3 and it has several wells that, uh, and a robotic arm. And the wells contain the solutions that we use and program into our uh, stainer. Uh, and this particular uh, picture shows this quite well. Each of these wells contains a different solution. The Minus 3 automated slide stainer can hold 20 slides simultaneously. We can stain 20 slides in a period of 8 minutes. For anyone who's ever done a gram stain, 
Uh, sometimes just to stain one or two slides could take eight minutes. At this point, we can actually stain 20 slides in eight minutes. There's nine different programs that uh, you can put into uh, the computer on this particular uh, instrument with 29 different steps. Uh, there are various sources of water you can use. You can use tap water if you'd like, uh, deionized water, or uh, USP filtered water. I'm going to be using deionized water today from a carboy that I have uh, suspended above the uh, instrument. This particular instrument also has a drying feature. It'll actually hold all 20 slides within the cassette next to a blower, so it helps speed up the time uh, for drying of the slides after they've been rinsed uh, and uh, stained and rinsed so that you can actually get it onto a microscope and help to identify the organisms much quicker. Also has an adjustable temperature. You can actually adjust the temperature from room temperature all the way up to 65 degrees Celsius. Here's a picture of the back of the instrument so you can see. We have several different parts. Uh, we have our drain. Uh, I'm going to point out just a couple of them with my pointer. We have a drain at this location right here that drains any of the water and any of the slide uh, stains out at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we have our power switch, which is the on and off switch that is located here. And then our uh, last important part on the back of the instrument that I want to show you is where the water supply comes in. This has a quick disconnect on it, and you can uh, feed water in here up to a maximum of uh, 70 pounds per square inch uh, through that quick disconnect. The front of the uh, slide stainer has an LED screen where you do all your programming, and I have a picture of that here. And now I would like to demonstrate how the slide stainer works. All right, the first thing I want to do is turn my power on on the back of the instrument. And I'll wait for the LED screen to go through some diagnostic steps uh, before it's ready to, to start using. Now I have already filled my wells with all the solutions that I'm going to need for the gram stain. In the first well, I have my crystal violet. In the second well, I have my Graham's iodine. In the third well, I have my decolorizer, which I'm using ethyl alcohol. And in the fourth well, I have the safranin for Graham negative. Graham positive, the mordant, which is the Graham's iodine, the decolorizer, which is the uh, ethyl alcohol, and then the safranin, which is used for uh, the gram negative, uh, staining gram negative organisms. This particular instrument I mentioned can do 20 slides at one time. It has a cassette, and on the cassette there are two holes in the back that fit on the two uh, probes of the robotic arm. I can simply slide this cover back, place a slide into one of 20 different locations within the cassette, slide the arm back, let gravity take care of keeping the cover down, place it back onto the posts of the robotic arm. And now I have already programmed into my instrument the steps needed to dip each of my uh, into each of my wells with the solutions that I need for gram stain. I'm going to program number one, and I'm going to hit enter. The robotic arm carries the cassette over to the crystal violet, and it will uh, raise up and down several times for 60 seconds to ensure that I am flooding the entire slide with the crystal violet solution that is needed for staining uh, organisms that are gram positive. Next thing I want to do is make sure that I turn on my water 
so that I can flood this well for washing. And one thing I typically will do is pour to prime some water to the very top level just to make sure that I have a good prime of water. Now it's going through the rinse. The water will feed from my water source on the top through the bottom of this well and will feed it up now that I've primed it. We're rinsing, and this is deionized water, we're rinsing our slides with deionized water. The next thing the robotic arm will do is carry the cassette to our mordant, which is the Graham's iodine. I like to think of the mordant as the cement. If indeed we have a gram positive organism, the mordant will hold that blue or purple stain to the cell wall of the organism. If it's not, it will release that blue stain from the cell wall. And it will go through the same steps of dipping for 60 seconds. Again, that's all been programmed into your slide stainer. The LED screen actually has a clock that counts down how long each dipping procedure is in each well and actually how long the, the entire slide staining procedure will be. Right now I have five minutes left of the whole procedure and if I had 20 slides in there I've saved a lot of time. Now it is rinsing once again in the deionized water. to ensure that all of the mordant, the Graham's iodine, comes off. Now one additional thing as part of a Graham stain is we put a decolorizer onto the stain which will pull off any excess blue stain that might still exist. The mordant cements it, the decolorizer pulls it away if it doesn't belong. All right, we're going to rinse the decolorizer off. All these steps have been programmed according to approved protocols for Graham stain. And that's one of the nice things about this particular instrument. You can program it however length of time and whatever solutions you need, up to four solutions. Now you'll notice we're doing our dipping steps into the safranin, which will hold uh, the uh, red or pink color to gram-negative organisms, if that's what we have. And we have about 30 seconds left of the dipping here. And according to my display, I have about three and a half minutes left of the whole cycle, including the drying time. All right, we're now going to rinse one last time in our water. In the bottom of this instrument, we have a tray that goes to a drain at the other side, at the back side, and drains all of our water and solutions uh, that are waste into a sink. All right, we're now coming out of the water rinse. We're going into our final well over here where a blower has just turned on and will blow dry those slides for three minutes. It's a very effective, very efficient process for doing your staining. 
20 uh, slides in three minutes, or I'm sorry, 20 slides in eight minutes. Three minutes of that time is your drying time is very efficient. Okay, our identification of our organisms depends on whatever our staining method was. Once we have identified uh, a particular organism as a specific uh, genus of organism, uh, whether it's a, uh, a rod or whether it's a coccus or something like that, and whether it's positive or negative, we can then determine what additional uh, techniques we need to employ to I further identify the organism that is resident in our environment. That's a little bit about the uh, way things are done in industry. Uh, it's very interesting how uh, we can collect not just data from the total number of particles that we have in a, a controlled environment, but we can also collect data uh, that will tell us what is actually in the environment. What does that do for us? Well, if we know what's in the environment, it allows us to then uh, take steps to prevent it, whether it's it's through de uh, decontamination techniques, additional filtration, additional training of personnel to avoid uh, contamination of uh, the environment from us. Uh, whatever the case may be, this additional knowledge allows us to be able to take steps to mitigate these issues to help us control our process and help us control our environments much better. If you'd like to learn more on May the 20th and the 21st, uh, of 2010, uh, at NC State University's BTEC campus, there will be an environmental monitoring conference from 8 to 4 each day. Uh, if you register for this particular conference but before March the 31st, uh, the cost is very affordable. Uh, you can register afterwards, but you'll pay a little bit more. You can register by calling the 800 number that is listed on your uh, uh, screen, or you can register by going to ncbionetwork.org and uh, register uh, online. Please be sure and stay tuned for additional offerings on our website at the same address that you see listed here uh, for uh, more opportunities for you to learn more about what it takes to work in this industry and some of the, the techniques that will help you be successful in this industry. Thank you very much for your participation and attendance today. It's been a pleasure.